Well, I think we've all seen the state of deterioration in America's cities and obviously downtowns of places like Seattle and so on, who's bombed out war zones, San Francisco's Fisherman's Wharf's completely shuttered up. But what about the areas that are just slightly out lying that. What about the suburbs around these areas? Well, it turns out I had an experience about this, so I thought I'd like to share it with you. Hey, everybody, I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott, and I want to tell you about my Monday in Santa Monica. Um, my wife, Natasha, beautiful, lovely wife, Natasha, needed to go to Santa Monica for just a routine medical appointment. It was only about 20 minutes long. We parked the car. I was thirsty. I walked across the street to this, like, the, the most hippie co-op you can possibly imagine. I mean, the patchouli oil smell, they open the doors, it just almost knock you back. I just going in there to get some bottled water, and, and I saw some flowers, and I'm standing there in line. And as I'm looking at the front door, I see an altercation. And the altercation is between a large man and a, and a relatively normal-looking woman, both tugging on a bag. And I thought, he's trying to steal her bag. And as I'm watching, this guy reaches into her bag and starts removing these items and putting them back on the store. He was, this, he was the security guy. He was the loss prevention guy. Hmm. And she, was, she just walked in there to take stuff. And Steve, here's the thing that struck me about this. The security guy wasn't adrenalized. He wasn't, he wasn't angry. He wasn't stressed you know what he looked like to me he was bored he was annoyed he's like <laughs> he, he has apparently seen this so much yeah. that that he was bored and the person didn't put up a fight either she just he just took the things out and she went running off so when when it gets to the point where you know that somebody who's caught stealing rent handed it's pointless to call the police because the police won't come because the Pro progressive in charge of the police department or the government, the state or whatever, is going to simply say, no, we don't, we don't go after those kind of people. That store now has a ticking time bomb under it. There is going to be a time when that store will no longer be able to stay in business because as this pathology spreads out, more and more people are just going to be walking into the store and taking stuff because nothing happens to you if you do. Yeah. Uh, question: Was this a national chain or a, like a local mom and no, pop? No, no, it was a little tiny little co-op. Okay, that's that's what I figured. I, I, that's right. You did say co-op, that that slipped out of my brain. And the reason I ask is the national chains, uh, Walgreens, CVS, and all the rest. Um, their policy is don't touch these people, don't harm these people, just let them steal what they want yeah. because they don't want the liability. Um, and the result, of course, is that Walgreens and CVSs are are pulling out of places like San Francisco. Um, and California voters, it, California is the worst example of it because your own people, Bill, I know, wrote it into this is the what Constitution. They voted for. I said, "Congratulations, here it is." Yeah, so, that what is it? Uh, Nine hundred fifty dollars or less is is petty theft, and they're, they're not going to bother to prosecute it. It's it, it was a constitutional amendment. California voters approved it. Well, here you go. Here you um, go. Uh, the, the truth of our crime situation is it is not as bad and also worse than we think. The The worst part is the, the really petty stuff, the, the shoplifting that won't get prosecuted. Um, you know, you've got professional idiots like AOC saying, oh, these people just, you know, they're hungry. They need their loaf of bread as they rip off the Gucci stores or whatever. Um, but the fact of the matter is most of the shoplifting in San Francisco is done by organized rings out of Oakland. These are these are gangs who know exactly what they're doing, and mm -hmm. then they sell this stuff in the on the black market, uh, either in person or online. Uh, police are powerless to do anything about it because it doesn't really matter how many goods get collected in one place because each little theft was under a thousand dollars. So, yeah, part of the Constitution now. Uh, the way in which it is uh, maybe not as bad is, yes, there have been violent crime uh, spikes in all of our major Democrat cities, uh, but we're still nowhere near where we were in the early 90s when, when the crime wave that started in the 60s finally started its its long, slow decline. And uh, I mean, God, New York City is still one of the safest cities in the world, uh, if you go by the statistics. it's It's had a spike, but... It's still much better than it was, say, in 1990. The scary part, though, is the randomness of it. You go back to the, uh, the Prohibition days when it was the, the police and the mob having, you know, running shootouts downtown. Uh, the violence was mostly contained to between 
the mob and the police. The, the mob knew if they went after civilians, the police were going to get very personal about it and skip the law and order and go straight to the shoot you guys. Uh, so as long as you weren't a mobster or a cop, chances of you being affected by violence were very, very small. There is a, um, a book I read in the mid-90s. I need to go back and reread this because it was just pressing. It's called The Sovereign Individual. I'm pretty sure I've mentioned it before. Uh, the authors, a couple of English gentlemen who wrote this thing, they, they were so far ahead of their time. They were predicting cryptocurrency in the 90s when they wrote this mm. book. Uh, they didn't call it that, but they described it in pretty good detail. Uh, and what they said was, we are about to enter a, a beautiful phase where violent crime rates are going to dropped dramatically. And they said, I think this book came out in 92 or 93. So they were like right, right on the top of the curve here, uh, just pressing as hell. But what they also warned was the violent crime that remains is going to become much more random. It's going to be the crazy person who pushes you in front of the subway train, uh, not not the gangster going out and, and just shooting up the, the corner. And Again, they were completely right, Bill, and it, uh, it, it is our refusal to aggressively treat mental illness and drug addiction, and the two get wrapped up together out on the streets, that has made crime so random, and that is what's scary about it. You saw the, the gentle thing, one loss prevention guy stopping one shoplifter, but it's, it's the crazy person you don't see coming that's, that's the real fright, and that, I think, is what has people so on edge. I could not have better written a better um, introduction for my question to Scott. It was just it's just absolutely perfect. So there's a second part to the story, Scott. Um, I, I'm sitting in there in line. I pay for my uh, water and the flowers, and I'm walking back to the car, and I'm wondering where this woman went. She just went wandering down the street or something. And as I'm walking back to the car, I realize, oh, there she is. She's about 50 yards behind the car. And she's got her, I think she's like trying to tie shoelaces up against the, the side of this building. And she's very angry because she wasn't allowed to steal the stuff she wanted to steal. And as I walk closer and closer, just keeping my eye on her, uh, she was so angry about getting stopped at the store that she picked up a big rock and threw it at the window of this foundation and institute, put a hole in it about that big and, and, and cracked an area that size. Just picked up a rock and threw it and cracked this window and then just went mumbling down the street. Uh, you, you could make a case for Ab ab abnormal human behavior and, and impulse control if somebody got caught shoplifting and they went back and threw a rock at the window of the store that that just did that but that wasn't what she did she just grabbed a rock and threw it at a random window because she was angry and and this kind of insanity this kind of low level insanity is is the natural byproduct of, of not only not enforcing the law, but not but not having any kind of a of a plan for mentally ill people who've been just increasing on the streets of our cities and suburbs in in, in incredibly uh, enormous uh, numbers. Well, and as a citizen, you know, you're put in a tremendously awkward position because most of us are not equipped to deal with something like that. Um, we don't have any kind of training on how to deal with severe mental illness or somebody who's just behaving in an erratic manner. Um, our instinct would be self-protection. And if you were, you know, in California, if you were possibly able to, to carry a concealed weapon, you'd be on your guard and ready. Uh, but you'd also be thinking, this person is not all there. And uh, so it's a different thing than somebody who's hunting me down or coming to rob me personally, this person's just chaotic and filled with rage. And uh, you can't have many of those kinds of people and and maintain a stable public society. Um, you know, you, you got to wonder which came first, the, the retreat of everybody inside of their homes uh, to stare at their televisions instead of sitting on their porches and chatting with their neighbors. Um, did people retreat from the from the threat of outside or did the threat from outside emerge as people retreated? But either way, uh, you've got a situation now in some cities that make them 
uh, only indoor livable. And um, and that's got to be terrifying for somebody who actually lives in a neighborhood like that. Um, you don't, you know, you can't go restrain that woman yourself. You've got to call the authorities. Are they going to come when you say, hey, I'm in Los Angeles and there's a crazy person who's throwing rocks? I don't think so. <laughs> and if they do... The whole time they're thinking, oh, great, my body camera's on here. I can't, I, how am I going to dance around this situation, try not to get hurt in the process, and yet neutralize this threat to property and, and persons? Um, it, it's like a no-win situation. I mean, I feel sorry for the, the guy and, and kind of admire the guy in the store who had the guts to reach out and say, give us our stuff back and, and reach into the bag and, and pull that out. I know when I worked at a, a major national, international probably, uh, retailer, they told us what Steve said. It's like you never accuse anybody of shoplifting. You certainly don't try to physically restrain them in any way. Um, you can let the security team know. They may or may not call the police, uh, depending on what's going on. But there, it's you've given all the all the power to the person who is least in control of that power to the to the crazy person uh, in the streets, and you've neutralized any ability to be able to deal with it, even in a spirit of helping that person. Uh, you know, to it's considered to be violence to them to say, hey, let's get her off the streets and let's get her living in a place where people who are professionals can keep an eye on her and maybe where she can get the treatment or medication that she needs. Um, that's considered cruelty these days. It's an inhibition on her freedom. But is it okay for her to throw a rock through somebody's front window? I, I, I don't think so. As I mentioned at the beginning of this, the thing that most struck me about this, struck me enough to want to do a show about it, was the attitude of the security guard who looked like he did this every 10 yeah. minutes. That's the, that's the thing that, that struck me. So just in this one particular case, and I understand it's one case, I spent some time thinking about an important question, and that question was, is this woman insane or not? Is she actually functionally crazy? Because no question, there's large numbers of people on the street whose brains are cooked through alcohol or drugs or, 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 or just inherited psychoses and so on. And, and the more I think about it, the more I realize I don't, I don't know, but I suspect she's not insane. I suspect she's just very angry and very entitled and has, has never been punished for anything. And so when she's angry, she throws rocks at things and she'll continue to throw rocks at things until, until somebody puts her in jail and stops her throwing uh, rocks and things. So this is, this is the challenge. And the actual challenge that we're going to be facing coming up, folks, is... If law enforcement is prevented from doing their job, and by law enforcement, I don't mean the police officers, I mean the people that are in charge of the police departments who tell them you can't arrest homeless people, you can't do this, you can't do that, those, those kind of things. If law enforcement is no longer able to provide um, uh, law and order, then citizens will provide that law and order. But here's the problem. The biggest problem we're going to be facing is that for the foreseeable future, the power of the state is on the side of the criminals. Yeah. This store cannot just simply say, okay, you know, you come in here again, you're going to get roughed up. Or, or, or if, you, if, you, if, somebody, if she had come in to the store and made a move on this guy with a knife and this guy would shot her, probably the guy would go to jail. And if she survived, she'd probably sue the store and, and, and you know, win a big settlement. So when, so when the power of law is on the side of the criminals, and that's where we are now in large parts of the country, where the law protects the criminals and, and, and prosecutes the people who are doing the sensible thing, that's a, a real inhibition to the natural order of things, which would be for people to take things into their own hands and, you know, and, and, and basically deal with it. Um, I, I don't know what to say about this individual woman. I don't know whether she belongs in jail or whether she belongs in a mental institution, but the thing I am sure of is she doesn't belong on the streets. Um, you like to think, and I do believe, that some significant portion of these kinds of people are recoverable with with yeah. a lot of therapy and a lot of treatment. When I say recoverable, I don't think they're ever going to be normal, but I think they'll be able to function or at least coexist in society. But when we were talking about uh, the the, um, the changes in the fourth turning and the uh, things to come episode, as I was driving away from this situation, 
I'll tell you my final thought. As we were driving away on this, I'm thinking it's just another sign of this coming crisis between the law-abiding and the lawless. And I thought, who are going to be the soldiers in this new fight? And I realized, you know, it's going to be an army of therapists. That's who are going to be the foot soldiers. Armies of therapists and defense spending on, on facilities to house people who either through drug abuse, alcoholism, or just plain bad parenting are not capable of functioning in society. We're facing a big problem. It's going to get bigger, and, and it's just something to keep your eyes open for. We'll get through this. We've gotten through everything else. We've gotten through worse than this. But the, the problem is going to be, in, in some way, similar to the problem that Israel does have right now. Moral people who, who have a conscience and who don't want to do harm to people are going to be forced to do things that they don't want to do. They're going to be forced to, as one of our uh, Stratosphere Lounge members said, going to be forced to, um, to bring down the hammer of the law. And that requires us toughening up a little bit and, and, and not treating everything as if it's completely meaningless, because it's not. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Right Angle.